In this video we are covering reflection and refraction. Reflection comes off of mirrors and refraction comes off of lenses. Setting up some definitional terms, wave fronts and waves. A wave front, the line or surface defined by adjacent portions of a wave that are in phase. Now that's just fancy book talk for a draw straight line through the crest of each wave. So if you have your source of light here and your source of light is shooting a beam straight across. At the peak of each crest, you're just going to draw a little curve line, or you can do it as a straight line down. Now these straight lines are your wave fronts. A plane wave front is when dealing with a specific wave front. Consider that wave front to be a plane. Now that's similar to how we view the world as we move about. You know that the planet is a sphere, now, despite the curvature of the Earth, wherever you're living, the way you view your street block or just the area, your county, whatever, you always view that as a flat plane. So you can view these individually as a flat plane. And when you're setting up your diagrams, that's just going to be the your axis or your axi. Axis? Axi? Whatever. Now, your ray is a line perpendicular to the series of your wave fronts and in the direction the wave is going. And light is often described as a ray, especially when you're doing calculations and setting up your diagrams. Now just be sure to set that up as perpendicular to the wave fronts and not perpendicular to the wave itself. So if you have your source here and straight across, let me do that in another color, if you have your light beam coming from a flashlight or whatever you got, candle, you have your light straight across, you have your plane wave fronts or your normal wave fronts there, and then perpendicular to all that, you have your rays. Now, just a little cheat note if you have your wave coming straight out, you can just consider that a ray, doesn't really matter unless it's very particular and you need to draw a diagram for an exam but essentially your rays are your wave only a straight line not acting as a wave so you'll see this uh, discussing light in terms of waves fronts and waves uh, this is all called geometrical optics and in this model we assume that light travels in a straight line off of an object so if you have your source here uh, where's my if you have your source here Light is always going to travel in a straight line off of that object. Pretend that's straight. And moving on. Oops, control page down. So here we have reflection. Now, reflection is defined as the absorption and re emission of light. Now, it's a really complex atomic process, but to put it simply, you can describe light using waves, rays, and vectors. So for calculation purposes, this all comes from the law of reflection. Now in the law of reflection, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Both angles are always measured from the normal, and rays and the normal all lie in the same plane. So your angle of incidence, the incident means the ray coming from the light source. So incidence simply means source. Reflection is the angle that is, wait for it, reflected. If reflection off a smooth surface, you have a regular reflection, which is like what you have on a mirror. And if reflection off a rough surface, you have diffuse or irregular reflection. So smooth, regular, rough, irregular. Angle of incidence always equals your angle of reflection. So here I drew a nice little smooth surface. So here if you had a flashlight beaming down and whoops that does not look like a flashlight I can't draw so anyway if you had a flashlight right here and the flashlight was shooting light at a mirror the mirror would reflect that light and the angle that the light hits the mirror is going to equal the angle that reflects off the mirror and in between these two reflections you draw a dash line or a bunch of dots however you like to draw your line and that line is the normal you always calculate or draw 
the angle away from the normal. So if you have the normal here, it's on the inside between those two. Always show the ray in relation from the inside of the normal. Now on an irregular surface, it won't be so smooth. So you'll have your normal won't be straight essentially on an irregular surface. Um, you can on an irregular surface, like if here was your surface, you could tilt this whole thing so that it's normal, but that's a bit more complex. So just remember that on a regular surface, on a rough surface, you'll have a regular reflection and your normal will be crooked. Let's go back to my arrow here. So on a mirror example, get out of here, start menu. So your image distance is equal to your object distance, and this is similar to the law of reflection where incidence equals reflective. So if you have an object that is x distance away from a mirror, now let's say that's you here getting ready for the club, the reflective image will seem to be x distance away from you inside the mirror. So all that means is you, if you have an object that is two feet away from the mirror, the object inside the mirror will also appear to be two feet away from the mirror on the inside of the image. The reflected image is called a virtual image because light is not actually bouncing off the image in the mirror. It's an illusion of the light bouncing off the surface of the mirror and your brain just interprets that as having as the mirror having depth. So only the light bouncing off the image off the glass and directly into the eye is the light that you actually see. And this is interpreted by the brain and that light is shown in blue. So this is different from a real image where light passes through the image and into the eye, which is what you have on a lens, and that would be refraction, which, what, which is what we're coming to next. So whenever you look in a mirror, all you're actually seeing is this light coming off of you. Let's get a bigger thing here. You see the light coming off of you, bouncing off the mirror, and directly into the eye. And that's all you're actually seeing. The illusion is this light into the mirror here on this side. So that's the virtual image. Come on, page down. There we go. Now, spherical mirrors. Uh, these, there's too much to discuss so for the sake of time and scope of keeping this to reflection and refraction. I'll have to, to refraction rather, I'll have to devote an entire video to those types of mirrors. So here you have a convex mirror, which is a bulging mirror. And that gives a very wide range of view, like the mirrors in your car, your rear view mirrors, those are convex mirrors. A concave mirror is here. This is a concave mirror. And that gives a magnified image, like those cosmetic mirrors that you use for plucking your eyebrows. And the way I remember this is that think of it as a cave, concave. The light enters the cave, and when it bounces, it bounces off into a focal point and that's what gives you a bit of magnification. But that's for a total separate video. On this one, we'll just focus on refraction and re reflection and refle refraction. I'm having trouble talking today. So for a refraction, refraction is the change in direction of a ray when it enters into a different medium. So that's like light entering from air into water or from air into a diamond anything where you have d two different mediums holding light. So the angle of reflection, refraction is given by Snell's law, or the law of refraction. The speed of light is different in different media. So the media that the light travels through will essentially offer a resistance to the light and change its speed. The sine of the angle of incidence, which is the angle of the source, over the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to the speed of light in the first medium over the second medium. Now that's just fancy talk for saying that if you have your incidence, your angle of incidence over the angle of refraction, just take the sine of those angles. So the sine of the incidence over the sine of the refraction. And that equals Snell's law. Now your index of refraction is what Snell's law equals. And that's the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a new medium. So if you had the speed of light in a vacuum, which you know is C, is 3 times 10 to the 8th, and divide that by the speed of light in the medium. And that's your N, and that's your index of refraction. 
So n equals c over v. So c is your speed of light in a vacuum, which is ten, 3 times 10 to the 8th, and v is the speed of light in the new medium, be it water, air, whatever you got. And when you divide those two, you get n, and that's your index of refraction. So here I drew a little diagram. So here's your angle 1. So this is your angle of incidence. This is your source light, be it sunlight from a vacuum in space entering air, our atmosphere on Earth, or from air into water. You'll see here is your normal, and here's your first medium, so be that the air or space, and here's medium two, be that water or the atmosphere. So here's your normal. So your ray is actually going to bend, and this is the image that you're going to see, and it's going to bend closer to the normal or away from the normal, depending on which index is bigger or smaller. And here's some indexes of water, air, and diamond. These you might want to commit to memory. A lot of your problems are going to involve waters, diamonds, and air. Whoops. Now, the frequency of light never changes in any medium. But its wavelength, which is given by lambda, does change. So the wavelength of light in the material is different from the wavelength of light in a vacuum. And the speed of light in a medium is n which is your index of refraction, which is a measure of the optical density, which is fancy talk for the resistance that that medium is going to offer to light flowing. Now this is like a resistor in a circuit. Uh, in a way, not really, but you can think of it that way. Light moves at different speeds in different mediums. So N1 is your first index, and that's multiplied by the sine of the incidence's angle. And N2 is your second medium's index, and that's multiplied by the sine of the refraction. So keep your incidence and refraction together when you're doing calculations with Snell's Law. And don't confuse this with reflection from the last section. This is refraction. So in assigning variables, be really sure to keep the proper n with its respective angle. And a little side note here, if the second medium has a bigger n, then the first medium, your ray bends towards the normal, and if your second medium has a smaller n than the first medium, your ray is going to bend away from the normal. So here is how you will normally see Snell's Law when you're doing calculations. So if you had, let's say, air and water, this n would be a 1. Let me do that in another color. This n would be a 1, and then you would have your sign that of that angle striking the second surface, and then that would equal the second one. So let's say your second one was the diamond, so you would put your n of the diamond here, and then the angle of that light strikes the diamond here. So here would be your theta in degrees. And then you would solve for one or the other. So you would either divide this n1 by the sine, and therefore, but we'll get into problems in the next video. So some examples. Now light on the ground has a lower index of refraction than light than the light in the air. So the light would bend in a different manner, giving the illusion of a wet surface and a reflective image. It is light bending through the different density of air and the ground. Since the ground since the air on the ground would be a different temperature from the air above the ground, the light would bend differently. So that gives the illusion of a reflective surface, when right here all you would really have is simply sand. And the same, a principle, the same principles applies to pencil in a cup. And this effect has tremendous implications, from mirages to pencils to even the sun's location in the sky. It's often not the actual location of the sun, it's just where light is bending through our atmosphere to project the image of the sun. So when you look into the sky and see the sun, that sunset, sunrise, it's actually not the true position of the sun. It's actually sort of a bent, distorted image, and the sun isn't really where you see it is. So those are some pretty cool examples. Now, total, total internal reflection. When light goes from a medium with a high resistance, like water, into air, which has a lower resistance, the ray moves away from the normal. So if the angle is 90 degrees, the refracted ray ends up parallel to the boundary of the two mediums. 
if the angle of incidence of the ray is refract refracted back into the medium, this is called total internal reflection. And you get this from Snell's law that we learned earlier, and that's just really fancy talk for saying put the sine of 90 degrees in, which is going to equal 1. So when this equals 1 and you do your math, this is going to disappear, and you end up with your angle of incidence times your index of refraction for incidence equals n2. And when you divide your sine out, you'll just have n2 over n1, which is your angle, uh, your critical angle, which is your angle of total, total internal reflection. So to put this into context, if you have your incidence here hitting a plane, and that plane would generally, your light would enter or reflect back out and go straight, total internal reflection as your angle changes, you may have your light reflecting in and then across the boundary line, but you could have your light reflect in across the boundary line and then back into the boundary. That is total internal reflection. And Now this is what diamonds do and why the cut on a diamond is so important. And that's what gives diamond its attribute called brilliance and that's what makes them so sparkly because the light is hitting the diamond, coming out, reflecting across the boundary, and then back into the diamond, depending on how well your jeweler cuts that diamond. So when you see total internal reflection and you're asked to calculate the critical angle, just turn one of those angles, either the incidence or the reflection, into sine of 90. And essentially you're just dividing your n2 over your n1. So the Re so the incident angle, the n, the incidence of the second one over the n of your first medium, and that gives you your critical angle. So you may need to take the arc sine of that angle at the end of the calculation to get the actual number of the angle, depending on how your calculator works. Some of them will give them instantaneously, some just give you a strange number that you need to take the arc sine of to get your actual critical angle. So I hope this makes sense. It is pretty complicated. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email. Or if you have any problems you're having trouble with, shoot, shoot that to me in an email, and I will tackle them in the next video on calculations. Thanks for watching.